look back. Okay, I will have that in there along with the guillotine. All right, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, we're going to move on and talk about the Declaration of Hispanic and Citizens. Okay, and we're going to mention more about this Constitution of 1791 and what's going on with Louis the Sixteenth. All right, so here's your bell ringer for today. Describe what the tennis court oath was. Explain what came out of this event in France. There you go. There you go. Which was one of your vocab terms from yesterday. We'll talk more about it today. Chris, what's up? Uh, in order to like describe the keys, you possibly watch that one scene part of the What? I think I think we need a test. A great, a You're right. It is. It is. How about you pull it up at the end of class here? Maybe we can pull it up there. All right. We're talking about the greatest heroes of the world. Oh, okay. So everybody else, Wait, okay. think of uh, movies that we can apply to. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Hey, Bell Ringer, quiet, please. Thank you. Bell ringer. Okay. All right, okay, okay. So we talked about the three estates, right? Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh. Yeah, all right, sit down. So you talked oh, yeah. about the three estates. First estate consists of whom? Real oh, quick, let's get through this. Connor, go ahead. Uh, the king's family and the clergy. Yeah, good job, good job. So you got the king's family, the monarch, right? And then you got the clergy, the religious hierarchy. Okay, good. And then with the second estate, you have. Go ahead, B. Yep, the nobility, good job. So some consider the religious hierarchy in the second state as well. Either way, they have a high, a higher status than what we know of commoners, middle class, lower class. But anyway, okay, the first estate, right around 1% of the population. The second estate, right around 2% of the population. And when it came when it came to uh, land ownership, right, it's with the first estate, they own about 10% of land. 
I can see around 25% of land. So that's a lot of land for just a small sliver of the population. Okay, what about the third estate? Who makes up the third estate? All right, Chris. Yeah, good job. So you got your commoners, right? You got your middle class, lower class, some of the bourgeois, right? So that they own some of these businesses, these skilled artisans. Okay, and this is the backbone of the country. Right? This is over 90% of the population. And uh, with that, they are the only ones that do what? Pay the what? Go ahead, why? Yeah, the taxes. Good job. So the first and second estate, they're exempt from the taxes. All right, so after a lot of this hostility, a lot of the issues arising, okay, leading up to this French Revolution, okay, Louis the 16th calls on the three estates to meet. Right? So with the estates of general, right, uh, they meet together and they talk about, discuss some of these issues. All right, so what about voting? How does that go down? How does that go down? Go ahead, Connor. Uh, each estate has one vote. Yeah, good job. Do you think the third estate's happy with that? No, not at all, right? So if each state each state has one vote, that means when it comes to decision making, well, chances are you're gonna have two that kind of side together. And we all know, we talked about it yesterday, the first and second state, they side together uh, having a two thirds vote, right? They have the majority, two to one over the third state. So the third state, not too happy with this, right? What do they do? They form the what? They break off from this, uh, th this meeting. And they form a go ahead. Bodies. Uh, they form the National Assembly. Yeah, good job. They form the National Assembly. Good. So with this National Assembly, what does the third estate want to try to accomplish? What do they want to try to create? What kind of government? What kind of government? But Matt. Constitutional Yeah, good job. Their goal is to try to create a constitutional monarch. Good, good. So in all reality, what kind of power does the monarch have in a constitutional monarch? What kind of power? Ozzy, go ahead. Yeah, they're just there as a figurehead, right? So for the most part, it's just really decided upon these actions of government in uh, the country by the parliamentary system. So these elected officials, in all reality, they're just sitting there. Okay? They don't really have too much to do. Uh, in any case, do you think Louis XVI buys it? Do you think he wants this type of government? No, he still wants to hold on to this ancient system that's been around for close to a thousand years. Right, they're the divine right rule. Right, Louis the Sixteenth wants to have control and full power, full authority over the people. Good, good. <laughs> Seriously, man. No. All right. So with this National Assembly, K. Louis the Sixteenth wasn't too happy with it. Right. So before the Third Estate could form a constitution, they're going to the government building in Paris. They're trying to enter it. Right. And uh, they want to create this constitution, but the doors were locked. Are the doors wide open? Why? It's locked. Yeah, yeah they're locked. Man, I'm just trying to watch. Yeah, yeah there we go. Just trying to watch and rest. Plus, you restarted. Come on, go. It's your notes. Yeah, okay, whatever. All right, so the doors were locked, right? The doors were locked. So that just goes to show with Louis XVI how he didn't want this National Assembly to continue on. I didn't want this to occur. He didn't want a constitutional monarch. He didn't want to be stripped of his powers. Okay. So where'd they go? Where'd they go? And this is where we get to the bell again. Jason. Yeah, good job, right? So they go to this gym, this arena, and uh, on the tennis courts, they make an oath. And what was that oath? They weren't going to leave until they had what? Really, go ahead. A constitution. Yeah, good job. So they weren't leaving until they had a constitution. A written set of laws, freedoms, right? Liberties for the people. A new style of government. Okay, Louis the Sixteenth at this point is losing a lot of power. Came to a point where the people were in fear that he's going to launch the military on. But who makes up the military? Who makes up? Go ahead, Parker. Yeah, the common people, right? The third state. So in all reality, the power of the king, Louis the Sixteenth, is dwindling. Right? It's coming to some other close. All right. So the tennis court oath. Make sure you guys remember it. Okay, this is just that oath that they weren't going to leave this tennis court, right? Until they had a constitution. Until they had a new system of government that's more representative of the people of the third estate. All right, you see how this is all going down. You see how it's playing out. Okay, today we're going to talk more about the storming of the Bastille. Okay, those were the vocab terms we had yesterday. Sorry I didn't get to it yesterday, but we'll get to it today, I promise. But real quick, I only have two terms for you, which one of them we just talked about. The tennis court oath. Oh, yeah, I got to do that.
All right, so you got the guillot guillotine, sorry. You got the guillotine at the bottom, right? You got the tennis court oath. Okay, I forgot to mention that one in there, the tennis court oath. So make sure you just write it down. I know you have your bell right here, but anything, just make sure you have it as a vocab term. I don't want to get to the test and say, oh, this wasn't one of the terms. Well, there it is. Okay, so we got three of them. Oh man! Yes, I'll say the crowd. I'm gonna start with revolution. I am. Which means the one thing. All right, okay, okay. So we already talked about the tennis court oak. Okay. What about the guillotine? What is that, Caroline? Yeah, good, good, good. So with the guillotine. This was a form of public execution, right? Especially during this time of the reign of terror. So one thing to note here, we're gonna talk a lot about some deaths with the guillotine. And during this reign of terror, there's close to 20,000 people that got their heads lopped off for maybe going against the idea of revolution, right? So we'll mention more about this on Monday, but you gotta think, right? So with this guillotine, you know, it's not just saying there's one of them, but after some time, lopping heads off left and right, that blade's gonna get pretty dull, isn't it? Yeah. So there's actually stories out there that when they're chopping off some heads, executing people, eventually that blade got pretty darn dull. And when they're dropping the blade, they actually won't go fully through some of these necks here. So it would stop and boom, oh, oh. Everybody's like, the crowd's just sitting there, oh, what's going on? The head did pop off. Do it again, pull it up, and they drop it, and then, yeah. Eventually, they'll get through the head, right? Full of the neck. So, if anything, with the guillotine, right after some time, that blade will get dull. I thought that was an interesting story anyway. When I heard about it, I was like, can you imagine the whole crowd's cheering this on? And all of a sudden, it doesn't go right through the neck right away. It's like, well, pick it back up and do it again. Yeah. Oh, geez. What a sign of torture, I tell you. Oh, especially for this. Oh, man. Okay. Well, anyway, you shouldn't be going against the revolution, I guess, during this time. Okay, moving on. All right, so we did talk about Marie Antoinette yesterday. So what happens to her? We know that she gets it, right? And what did she say before that blade went down on her neck? Oh, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, good job. Let them eat cake, not pizza, cake, right? Yeah, so for her, right, in a way, she was trying to maybe rub it in in a case to the common folk, to the people. 
as they're struggling through these very hard and difficult times. All right, so again, here with the guillotine, we'll talk more about that on Monday with the reign of terror, okay? But with Louis XVI, he will also get it, right? This is kind of kickstarting the guillotine for this reign of terror. All right, so with the tennis court oath, this was that oath amongst the third estate, okay, with the National Assembly that they'll come up with a constitution, that they're going to look to strive for a constitutional monarchy, all right? And with Louis the Sixteenth, he's not going to buy it, right? He's not going to want this. This is going to strip power away from him, okay? And as we see here, he's losing power. All right, so the French Revolution continued here at the storming of the Bastille. So yesterday we talked about this, July 14th, 1789. So the people in Paris, okay, they were looking to even more put an exclamation mark on top of this French Revolution. So people gathered, okay, close to 200 people, and stormed the Bastille, which was a jail. Okay, it was like an armory of the time. It was almost like this symbol of the absolute monarchy. So as the people were storming the Bastille and tearing it down, right, they released the seven prisoners that were inside. That was it. Okay, but the goal too was to tear it down as this was a symbol of the absolute monarch. Okay, there were also weapons held inside. Okay, at the time, common folk didn't have weapons, right? They didn't have any type of, uh, let's say, muskets or muzzle loaders there present for them. So, with that, as they're taking these arms, this is again another symbol of an armed citizen, okay, against the absolute monarch, against the power at the time, and showing that this revolution is for real. All right, Louis the Sixteenth, hearing about this, he goes, "Oh, how's that, you know, that riot going on down there?" And uh, his advisor said, "It's not a riot; it's a rebellion. Right? Sooner or later, this might actually reach to you." So again, with the Bastille, it symbolizes injustices of the monarchy. How they may have just thrown people in jail for no reason, or executed people for no reason if they just didn't have really any say in the matter. All right? Again, these Enlightenment views are really carrying over to the people of France. They want their their uh, their voices heard. They want their representation. They want a say in government. Okay, they want their liberties, their freedoms. Okay, for so long in France, this absolute monarchy has reigned for close to a thousand years. So, if anything, the storming of the Bastille is like France's Independence Day, and they view this as their day of independence, the sign that something new is going to come, a government that's going to be representative of the people. And that they're going to get rid of this old system of government, this absolute monarchy. All right, so with the storming of the Bastille, there's about, you know, really a handful of people that died, okay, that were killed. All right, the governor of the section in Paris right here, uh, well, the area that included Paris, he was killed and many of the other guards. They're also beheaded and their heads were placed on pikes on, on really these, uh, uh, almost like a spear in a way, and they would hold it up and uh, they would carry it through the town, symbolizing that they have a new form, a new order coming, right? That they're seeking for a revolution, right? So again, those signs are just emphasizing independence, emphasizing the fall of the absolute monarchy. So again, make sure you guys remember the storming of Bastille, they call it Bastille Day in France. This is like their Independence Day. So again, July 14th. All right, so with that, they also had to break away from this absolute monarchy. So just like the Declaration of Independence in the United States, written by who? Who wrote it? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Thomas Jefferson. Yep, good job. So this was influenced to this Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens. Okay, this was their Declaration of Independence. Okay, this is stating their rights and freedoms, their liberties, and uh, really stating it against the monarch, right, Louis the Sixteenth. All right, so the purpose was to establish equality, right, and abolish this class system, to get rid of these three estates, to make sure that everybody was equal, right? You, know, you don't have this hierarchy anymore. Okay, this feudal system that we talked about ever since the start of this year, it's still carrying forth in, in France at this time. But now, here with this declaration, okay, this is eliminating this three-tiered estate. This is eliminating this feudal idea that's been around for close to a thousand years. So finally we see change, right? We mentioned about it with England, the glorious revolution, this constitutional monarchy formed. Okay, we talked about the American revolution at the start of this chapter. Okay, how these enlightenment views are really being seen and expressed in the constitution and the declaration of independence and how it was an experiment for really the rest of the world to see. And now France is 
seeing this and experiencing it and trying to uh, apply it to their own country. All right, so again, with these Enlightenment views, these ideas, they're being applied to France's government. So Montesquieu, we know Montesquieu's idea, right? What is it again? Montesquieu, Connor? Uh, isn't it like three branches of government? Three branches of government, good job. So separation of powers, checks and balances. You guys remember that? Okay, good. Rousseau, the jean jacket, right? Rousseau is the social contract, good. And we talked about Locke's ideas, right? So life, liberty, and honor. Property. Property, yep, good job. So these principles you can find in the Declaration of Independence, much like here in the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizens. Okay, also in the Constitution, popular sovereignty, government by the people for the people, limited government. Do you think Louis the Sixteenth wants this? Do you think he is going to accept this? No, not at all, right? So he rejects it, but we all know his power is dwindling and uh, it's really coming to a close here he knows that he's just kind of sitting there waiting for his time to come all right so even more with this revolution more social protests occurring so six thousand angry women march on versailles man i can only imagine just one angry woman right and you're like well, you got six thousand holy cow just i'm just joking just joking but six thousand angry women marching on palace of versailles and their whole goal here was to explain about the food shortages, a lot of the issues with acquiring food for the common folk. Okay, like I mentioned before, with inflation, it was just tough to buy and purchase food to place on the table. Okay, and with higher taxes, the common folk, the middle class, lower class, they couldn't even afford to even just put shoes on or have shoes or even clothing or even heat their home. Now, placing food on the table. Okay. We mentioned about that mini ice age, how that was causing a lot of hardships to the agricultural growth. Okay, Now we see a social protest against it. All right, so the king, uh, he actually was like, you know what? Yeah, take a lot of the flour that we have left over here at Versailles, which was wagon loads, Okay, and take it to Paris. Try to appease the people for some time. Maybe this will help out. Maybe this will try to you know, shift them away from, let's say, killing. Do you think that worked? No, they still were, they had, they were at its wit, uh, wit's ends with Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. So for Louis the Sixteenth, right, he was arrested here. And actually before he was arrested, he tried to flee the country. He tried to run out, try to run away, run away from his problems. But it didn't work, right? He was captured. And for him and Marie Antoinette, they were pretty much placed as prisoners in Paris for the remainder of their time, the remainder of their life. OK, so with these social protests, they're continuing on with the storming of the Bastille, right, ever since this tennis court oath. So you can see how things are transpiring, right? You can see how these social protests are leading to revolution. All right, so there you go. They're demanding food. And with this, this is kind of where that quote from Marie Antoinette comes from, where it stems from. Oh, let them eat cake when she gets her head lopped off. A lot of people say that she actually never said it, but... Anyway, it's a cool story, right? It makes it a little bit more drama, right? Get the drama involved. All right, so with that, the Constitution of 1791 was created. Political action, right? So this Constitution was formed. Okay, it was approved, right? So with the tennis court oath, they had this created. They're ready to put it intact and put, put it in place, right? But now here with Louis the Sixteenth being placed as a prisoner in Paris, well, now they could express this Constitution. Now they could uh, really put it out. All right, so this offered a unicameral legislature, which just means a one house, right? So one house legislature. What type of legislature do we have? What is it? Go ahead, Parker. Bicameral, good job, meaning two houses, right? We have a house of representatives and? Go ahead, Austin. The Senate, good, good. All right, so they call this the National Convention. So this one house legislature, okay, this is like their Congress, but it's only one house. They don't have a bicameral legislature like we have. All right, so everyone equal, all legislators get a vote. Okay, and uh, I thought this was interesting here. The delegates seated by their political beliefs. So that's something to note, especially when it comes to this separation of church and state. Okay, that was one of the primary ideas of who? Lightman thinker? Separation of church and state? Ozzy. Voltaire. Voltaire. Yeah, good job, good job. But in here, right, with the French Revolution, this is kind of still determining the value of this representation, which I think is interesting here. 
So this is one thing to note with the French Revolution. This is just one of the three constitutions that's going to be written. Uh, this revolution is not going to end, right? Like I said, with the reign of terror, this is just going to continue on into uh, a point where it's just really uh, uh, in, in a kind of like a never ending process, right? So there's really not going to be any stability until we see someone else rise to power, which is going to be Napoleon. All right, so here are three political groups that I want you to know. All right, so on the left, you got your radical, big change, support democracy. They want a republic. They want to get rid of this absolute monarchy. They want to make sure that Louis XVI doesn't have a say. All right at first, okay, there's something to note. Uh, the people actually wanted Louis XVI to still be the monarch, okay, to have this constitutional monarchy. Again, they're more like a figurehead, but in this case, Louis XVI will be protected. But we all know that's not going to work out. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the far left wants to see his head on a pipe. They want to see him be killed and to try to eliminate this system. The center, the more moderates, okay, often they want to support change. Okay, they want to support a constitutional monarchy. They want what England has. They see it being successful. People have rights. They have liberties. And at the same time, you still have this idea of an absolute, not an absolute monarch, but a monarch in place. Okay, you have a person that's there as a figurehead. Okay, you can kind of carry on this uh, tradition of lineage of this monarch. But we all know they don't really have too much power. So with the center, the moderates, they want a constitutional monarch. So Louis XVI, he still will be represented as this constitution, this uh, monarch. But again, he doesn't have too much power. All right, then finally, on the far right, you got this reactionary response. They want to try to keep an absolute monarchy in play. They feel like that brings the most stability. Again, it's been around for close to a thousand years. So with the far right, they want to try to hold on to this power. One thing to note is that there's going to be warfare, Austria and Prussia are in fear that these ideas, these revolutions might come onto their lands. So there is going to be war between France, Austria, Prussia in the center of Europe. And uh, there's a lot of people that were still holding on and thinking that, you know what, maybe we keep this absolute monarchy. Why? Because there's warfare, right? If we lose this war, we lose this conflict, chances are there will be no France, right? And this whole revolution will be for nothing. So that's something to note about these discussions, these issues being talked about after Louis XVI's capture here. All right, so we will talk more about this on uh, on uh, Monday. But in anything, uh, this just pushed for the Jacobins' the left side. Okay, this more republic, democratic view of government. Okay, they want to have representative values. Totally eliminate the monarch from the equation. Just get rid of them. Right. And uh, they gain a lot of support. They actually gain a lot of control within this unicameral system. And with that, there goes the monarch. Okay, there is no constitutional monarchy under the system. It is just totally met by a democratic system. There is no figurehead, right? So Louis XVI is tried before a convention and convicted, and he is killed, right? He is executed by the guillotine. His head is lopped off. All right, one thing to note, like I mentioned just with last slide, is that Austria and Prussia, okay, they see this as a means that the revolution might carry over to their lands. And if it carries over to their lands, right, chances are we'll see a lot of turmoil, a lot of problems like we see here in France. So with Frederick the Great, right, and with Austria, okay, Prussia, they're seeing this and they're in fear of what might happen, of these, this revolution might, uh, it might appear on their doorstep. Okay, like I mentioned, though, with Frederick the Great, he was one of these enlightened absolute monarchs. So he was offering some opportunities, freedoms for the people. But if anything, we can see here with France that they're just totally getting rid of this monarchical system. Okay, and this is where Louis XVI is beheaded. And also with Marie Antoinette, just nine months later, we talked about it already. She is also beheaded. And this is going to bring on the reign of terror. So what's going to happen? Who's going to fill his void? Okay, who is going to lead the country, especially during wartime, against two strong powers in Europe? Right? We'll talk more about it on Monday. Okay, is there any questions? All right, that's all I got. Oh.